this afternoon I am going to talk about uh, happiness, maybe a little on Brahma Viharas, a little on the awakening factors, causes of happiness. I'm not sure. <laughs> a little of, of all of it, a medley. I'll, I'll start by things that came to mind during my interviews. Uh, four, four ways that practice brings us happiness. The first I want to talk about is the happiness of seclusion. That is how we create a shelter for ourselves, our practice, our heart, our body. And uh, the, the Pali term, we wake up also means a refuge and rest. And it's a refuge or rest from, first of all, from external intrusion. So the ways in which you have made a temple of your room or your home, your, your sitting space, virtual and actual. And we can feel that, you know, we can feel when externally we feel safe from unexpected intrusions or conversations um, because we're all practicing in different places and different conditions. Uh, we can't always have it perfect, but you know uh, those moments when you're just left alone long enough to feel that sense of external safety and what our heart does is um, internalize it, brings it into our interior so that we feel safe enough to begin to explore our inner landscape, our body, our heart, our mind. So this uh, happiness arises, a happiness of seclusion, not only from the physical intrusions, but uh, as that deepens, as a sense of solitude and seclusion, refuge deepens, we also feel a protection from inner intrusions, uh, basically the hindrances, uh, excessive sense desire, aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness, worry, doubts. Just having a rest from the hindrances causes the mind to come into stillness and brings a happiness, it brings a non-sensual happiness. It means it's not dependent on conditions being perfect externally. Whatever the conditions are, we can, we can consider life like, uh, like weather, turbulent systems. Uh, at, at times, it'll be uh, rough and wild, and other times it'll be quite calm and still. We can't control that. We can't control the winds and the currents, we can't control the weather. But we can gain a certain um, traction with how we respond to the turbulent systems. So a heart of developing these meditative uh, gifts, the awakening factors, and the tools to keep the hindrances at bay, to have seclusion from them. An actual cultivation where we feel a deepening, a progress. Absent the hindrances, we're already into the second kind of happiness that comes from, from concentration, the happiness of concentration, samadhi, stillness. That's when our our mind is collected or unified enough that it prevents most of the gross hindrances from arising. And then even the subtle ones that come from practice success. And then we, are, we grow attached to it. We want it to stay or we want more. We notice that uh, and feel that as a disturbance in our in our turbulent system universe. And because we can notice even these subtle 
cravings, wanting, desire, it too falls away. This is the strength of samadhi. This is what it means to have a collected, a perfectly unified mind-body. It's the function of samadhi to, to gather together all the myriad mind streams into one still pond that perfectly reflects what's going on uh, on the shoreline, the horizon, the sky, everywhere. And the third kind of happiness is uh, the happiness of contentment. As the, as the samadhi settles us, as we experience more stillness, uh, as we learn to navigate better the turbulent systems, actually use the stormy conditions to, to power our practice forward, to keep going deeper or to learn how to sidestep or tack around big, big waves or strong currents, we start to feel this sense of ease. There's a lot of uh, sukha coming forward. Sukha is the opposite of dukkha. It's a very pure and powerful spiritual happiness that has nothing at all to do with, with sense pleasures, with pleasant sights, sounds, sensations, thoughts, imagery, and so forth. It's, it's the, the happiness of this contentment is called the sweetest happiness of samsara. Upandita once said, it's like a, it's a kind of happiness you feel in deep practice um, where in the distance you, you hear the, the very lovely subtle sound of temple bells, the sweet sound of temple bells. Once in the Sagain Hills at the Chaswa Monastery in, in the mid 80s, uh, mid 90s, uh, I had that experience. I was sitting really quietly and there's no one else uh, up in the back of the valley where I was. Uh, and somewhere, a valley to the north or a valley to the south where the, where the nunneries are, I heard that, that sweet sound of the temple bells. And it just brought chills all over my being. And I remembered what Upandita said. And I felt the sukha rush, the sukha wat rush. And I could see how that could be. In this state of contentment, which also reflects some of the deeper insights along the Vipassana path of progress, um, one can even be experiencing a lot of pain but still there's this heart of contentment, of ease. One feels this pliancy, and flexibility uh, and stability, even when conditions are such that uh, it's unpleasant, this dukkha vedana, unpleasant feeling tone. It doesn't matter and doesn't disturb that stillness in the midst of the turbulent systems. And lastly, the uh, happiness of equanimity, going through all these layers of seclusion where we feel protected, sheltered, and at rest. And then the, the collectedness, the stillness of samadhi. And then that very subtle happiness that, that's so delicately, exquisitely sweet the sweetest happiness of samsara. Like uh, um, the tinkling of the bells, temple bells. And then dropping in as we do on occasion to that mental equipoise, feeling centered in the midst of things as they are, regardless of their pleasantness, unpleasantness, their wild nature, their calm, still nature. There's this profound understanding in the moment that's able to hold all of these. This is an important factor, both as a factor of awakening and in the, in the Brahma Viharas. 
in the Brahma Viharas, this equanimity uh, applies to ourselves, uh, other beings, and land, property, possessions, having a balanced relationship with that. Uh, and, and the wisdom of that allows us to act with skillful means, timely, appropriately, when it's helpful and not hurtful, uh, based on wisdom and compassion. As I mentioned before, alongside of uh, the awakening practice factors, uh, the energizing ones and the calming ones, we can, we can practice the Brahma Viharas. All of them or any one of them. So alongside of joy, alongside of courageous energy, alongside of calm concentration, we can call up a Brahma Vihara uh, and, and sort of like parallel arcs, they're practiced together. And, and the wisdom ones inform us, bring us more understanding of the Brahma Viharas, their strength, their purity, their depth. And the Brahma Viharas, on the other hand, are, are like catalytic forces that enhance mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, calm, concentration, and equanimity. The equanimity of Vipassana, on the other hand, has to do with balance in, in the face of our experience, our sixth sense world. Whatever, whatever we're facing, the, the five physical senses and the mind or heart sense, no matter what's going on, that, that this, is, this comprises, the six senses comprise our universe. We can't control how they unfold. That's a result of karma. We can't control pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. We just meet them every moment. What we do next is, is critical. It's like that portal of uh, uh, pleasant feeling tone, being conditioned to grasp, or unpleasant feeling tone, being conditioned to feel aversive. The equanimity of Vipassana is responding to experience, pleasant or unpleasant, by doing nothing. By learning not to attach and therefore practice greed with pleasant experience. Not to be aversive and therefore practice aversion with re regard to unpleasant experience in ourselves, in these six senses in the world. Instead, it's just attuned. We attune, use our body and senses as platforms for awakening, as portals for awakening. The great navigators of old, the uh, Polynesian navigators that arrived on these islands where some of us are 2,000 years ago, did so by this very means. They, they learned how to be still. A navigator was like a shaman or a yogi. They were protected, left alone, sheltered. They had their own um, refuge or place of seclusion where no one bothered them, no one spoke to them. And generally they slept an average of, of four hours. And then they'd, they'd attune to where they were using their senses, visual sense, the color, shape, form, light and shadow, uh, attuning to sound, uh, their body attuning to wind currents, water, ocean currents, through the canoe could feel where, where they were. Uh, some could feel up to five currents at once from the ocean through the canoe into their body. That, that kind of sixth sense door awareness that we're practicing here. The same sort of dedication and intention to attune to just meet what's happening. So if we do, if we don't react out of panic, or out of uh, grasping, clinging, out of aversion, that's where the wisest decisions come. 
with that attunement, then we, we know timing, we know right action. We know how to use our courageous energy skillfully informed by understanding, wisdom, by care, and make the right choices. So uh, a right choice is, is, is uh, the quality or the factor of intention, chetana, willful action. That's the, that's the actual meaning of kama or karma. We have no control over results. Results will come. We have no control over that. What we do have influence over is our ability to attune to this willful action, this chaitanya. Volition and karma are the same, the Buddha said. Karma means action. Chaitanya means uh, intention. The same as, as, as a willful uh, uh, act of thought, speech, or bodily action. Some years ago, maybe six or seven now, uh, at the very last retreat that Sayadaw Ulakana, our, our dear friend and, and colleague uh, and the, the first monastic with whom we taught the annual fusion retreat at Chazwa in the Sagain Hills. It was his last, <clears throat> last retreat because he learned that that month, January, uh, that he had cancer. It's pretty invasive. Um, one of the yogis at that retreat was a doctor uh, who understood what kind of cancer Ulakana had, said he had six months, which was exactly what he had left. Uh, so after the retreat, I, w I went to the hospital where he was in Mandalay across the river. Uh, and uh, I must have been looking sad and forlorn. He said, Stephen, and caught my eye, caught my attention. He said, um, please, don't worry. I have complete faith in my comma. He had such a connection with himself, his practice, his intention the life he had led, led uh, the goodness that he had spread, uh, that he was very at home with his actions and had, had no fear of what, what, what was to happen. <clears throat> I'll never forget the, the gravity uh, of that moment. It came to me, it was really helpful, it came to me uh, last year, last year, January, when I had the stroke, uh, and I was at one of my very favorite places on the planet, and uh, and, it, and it came to mind when later someone told me that I had a stroke. I didn't even I didn't know I'd been sitting, uh, and got up and kind of listed left and had to use my my arm to steady myself on the puja table where the Buddha and the candles and the flowers were. And, and later I reflected on what Ulakana was saying and I, I realized that, that something had gone in, you know, and I felt, I felt really okay. I, I felt like well, that was really a great dress rehearsal you know, when the real time comes, it's exactly how I would want it to be. <laughs> I'd like to be sitting with 30 yogis and just drop dead <laughs> right there sitting. <laughs> and so I keep that as a kind of mantra, a, a reminder. Stephen, don't worry. I have complete faith in, in my karma, you know. In, in He was saying in his... Chaitana, all his good actions of his um, long life and productive life, generous life.
anything can be our doorway. Just talking uh, with the yogis today uh, and over the retreat, it really doesn't matter what's happening in our life, it, what kind of crisis or, or pain or disease or brokenness we might be experiencing. Anything can be a doorway to awakening. The time of the Buddha, there was this, um, there was this great uh, commander who had just protected the, the country from an invasion, successfully repelled uh, the invasion. And so there was a big celebration with uh, food and music and dancing. And the commander, Commander Santiti, was, uh, was kind of taking it all in, you know, appreciating um, people's happiness and the success of, of saving the country. And he actually fell in love with one of the dancers. It's one of those karmic moments. <coughs> and then over the course of the evening, her karmic condition ended and, and although young, she fell over and died. And Commander Santati was in a lot of grief. The Buddha being a monk was not at the celebration, was not at the party. So the commander went to the monastery and weeping explained his grief, showed his grief. And the Buddha wrapped him, you know, with his gentle compassion and it pulled him in energetically into his heart and said, Commander Santati, let go of all thoughts of the past. Let go of all thoughts of the future. Do not hold on to anything at all in this very moment. Uh, and then through that vulnerability of, of Commander Santati's grief and through his intelligence, he, he took that transmission to heart and re reputedly became a, a, a stream into her, he touched the Dhamma, first stage of enlightenment, became partly awakened. Uh, and then later that evening became fully awakened. <laughs> and another example, the Buddha was coming back from alms round and he saw someone he knew was an acrobat, uh, Ugasena. And Ugasena was practicing on a, on a 40 foot bamboo pole that he would climb up uh, and, and stand on, balance on with one foot, one toe, and then one hand, one finger, with his feet pointed perfectly to the sky, just in this place of perfect bodily balance. And the Buddha walked up, stood right under the pole, looked up and said, Ugasena. And Ugasena didn't, couldn't move an inch or even really speak. So the Buddha went on, do not think of any, anything of the past. Let go of all thoughts of the past. And let go of all thoughts of the future. Do not hold on to anything at all in this very moment. And while still balancing on one finger on the bamboo pole, he became fully awakened. As far as we know, he just stayed there <laughs> till the Buddha walked away, enjoying the bliss of full awakening. So in this case, through the body, through Ugasena's perfect balanced body, he found awakening. With Commander Santati, it was through grief and loss, brokenness. Those were their doorways. Those were their entry points.
There's something very simple and intelligent that there's nothing outside of ourselves that we have to do or focus on, that everything we need is everything that we have, that all that we really have is our sights and our sound, our, our, our sensitivities, the eye sensitivity, which receives light waves or particles, and the ear sensitivity, receiving sound vibrations, and, and, and scent and taste, and the largest bodily organ of the body, receiving the imprint, the impressions of earth element textures and water element fluidity and cohesion and fire element experiences of of heat and warmth coolness cold and the air element qualities of firmness support uprightness as well as movement oscillation vibration that is the body that is the experiential nature of what we call the body. And added to that is the mind door, the mind sense, partly here in the heart base and partly mental. And then the imprint, the influxes are, are mental formations, images, thoughts, emotions. And when they come into contact, there's, there's thinking consciousness or emotive consciousness. So here again is the teaching of conditionality because of light and sense in an eye sensitivity and sound and ear sensitivity, the body elemental, body sensitivity and elemental contact. Then there's these six kinds of consciousness. This is our practice. Understanding, seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, body consciousness, emotive thought consciousness. We, we already have these. So it's like Santati's heart was broken and the Buddha found that Santati had the, the, the skillful means, the paramis, to use that brokenness to let go of all craving, all holding on. And the body of Ugasena was so poised, so balanced, exactly mirroring the kind of balance we, we practice in, in Vipassana and Brahma Vihara and using that as a doorway. Outside of that, there's nothing we have to memorize, you know, or, or learn. By now, our, our system just knows what resting in the moment means, what pre-conceptual or pre-verbal awareness is before thought proliferation, before we were previous to practice, we were living our lives uh, thinking about experience. With practice, there's this direct connection. We are the experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. The awakening qualities, the potential, <clears throat> they're already there. The four Brahma Viharas, they are the heart when freed of attachment and cruelty and fear. When the hindrances fall away, the heart, the Brahma Vihara heart radiates. There's, we don't have to continually repeat, repeat phrases or, or, or effort ourselves into the connection and, and boundless nature of unconditional loving kindness. We don't have to force ourselves to care. Care is just the natural response to where there's hurt, stress, fear, anxiety. <clears throat> Talking with one yogi today about you know, how to make a difference in the world is anger useful? Some, many years ago, someone asked the Dalai Lama if anger was ever useful. 
He was just quiet for a minute, two minutes. Like he was really taking that in. He said, no. Not really useful. There's different views and different people uh, try to make a difference using their emotionality. Uh, for, for seven years in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, I worked with the Green Group, uh, the national leaders of uh, the environmental groups in America, like Greenpeace, Trust for Public Lands, and Sierra Club. There were kind of, uh, there were 35 or 36, I would say, I could divide them into thirds. Those who were really interested in the practice, those who were really not interested in the practice, <laughs> and those who were willing to test it out. Uh, well, many of them are still now practicing, uh, you know, over 20 years later. But in, in our discussions after practice sessions, uh, I, I was surprised to learn that a lot of, for most of them, it was a career choice. You know, my idealization was that they were moved by environmental conditions, the oceans and the rivers and the forests and uh, state of the environment, climate change. Uh, and I was also surprised to learn that a, a lot of them were doing what they were doing in the political fray of Washington, D.C., or New York, or Boston, or San Francisco, or wherever. Um, and they used anger to motivate them. In fact, many of them were angry at each other. Some of these green group leaders hadn't even spoken to each other in five years. This, they had different philosophies and different political constituencies, different funding, different access to, at that time, Babbitt was the interior secretary and uh, Al Gore was our vice president, Clinton, the president. And they all had various relationships. And so, so there was jealousy and anger and ill will. It wasn't until the, the, our third retreat, maybe two or three years into, into this period of time where I worked with them, that uh, we did an experiment after our morning session of sitting and walking, where they, they all told a story about something they loved, something they do passionately. So, so one of them, Federation for Wildlife, you know, he made all these amazing bird sounds and duck sounds just with his hands. And, and another one took a rock and, and went through a four billion year history that made it sound like, you know, reading the Grimm's fairy tales. So it, was, it was all really riveting and powerful. And at the end of that session, we were at Robert Redford's place, Sundance in Utah. It's the first time many of them talked to each other or used words like love and trust. And where they touched, they hugged, they connected. And after that, uh, I, I, would, I would say, maybe more than half were sold on meditation, <laughs> on practice, and they would all show up for all the rest of the, uh, the sessions that year and the following years. Sometimes I, I say that the, the moral equivalent of anger is, is fierce compassion. Compassion used, directed at making change, but born out of wisdom, born out of wisdom and pure, boundless compassion, not filtered with, with anger. The motivation here, the chetana, the willful action, is the purest compassion that's innate to our heart, the heart's response of caring wherever there's discord, 
or something broken or out of balance. Fierce compassion, or we can say sometimes fearless compassion. That's when we're willing to be, willing to completely face wherever there's dukkha of any degree and not be afraid of it. To stand face to face in the midst of the wildest turbulent system, the greatest storms that are going on and, and be collected. For it's from this place, along with the wisdom of equanimity, that is most likely will use skillful means to make a difference, to shift the balance, to shift someone's mind and understanding. Because we, we don't have the power to control people's thinking, people's habits, people's bias. This little by little, however our particular system attune, attunes to uh, the currents, the flow of things, the tides, however we attune, however we use language and our demeanor, our thoughts, and how whatever our discerning wisdom is, is this appropriate or not appropriate? Is this helpful or is this hurtful? And it doesn't mean that we don't sometimes do actions where other people are hurt. Sometimes we do. Our task is to look to see if there was intention there to cause harm. And if not, then someone else has another agenda or a different view or another way and are perhaps hurt. We can still ask forgiveness or make amends, but still our own sense of what's pono in Hawaii, that means the right thing. Uh, righteousness, attunement, harmony, harmonious with doing that which is skillful and helpful. We have that sense of, of what's right. We have a sense of the timing. We have the sense of what's useful and most helpful, and we act from that place. Always checking, because intentions arise and pass every moment and can easily be changed. Intention is just another mental state. Because it's willed action, it's perhaps the most, in, most powerful of our mental states because it's what uh, collects, gathers up other, other qualities, other states, other desires, and then go, moves forward in action, thought, speech, or physical action. So intentions can be influenced to be very simple by greed, hatred, and delusion. Or intention, or intentions, can be influenced by generosity, kindness, compassion, and wisdom. And often we see a mix happening. We start off acting out of our, you know, a view that we're clinging to, we're attached to. And something shifts, either our own understanding or someone else's influence, and that intention shifts from being born out of essentially practicing greed to generosity and wisdom. Midstream, we can change. So we learn about intentions because we might be triggered by something and our initial response might be to, to hit back with unkind thoughts, words, or actions. We feel that intention and we feel the influence from the unhealthy, unskillful state in, because intentions are very swiftly arising and passing, impermanent like everything else, we can check it. We can drop that intention and feel that just about to arise angry thought, emotion, word, or action, and check it. And then realign. What do I really want to say? What do I really want to accomplish? What's appropriate and what's timely, what's useful? And then act out of that understanding. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I was going to say something angry. I don't mean that. Just, you did this or you said that and it made me feel this way. And then we communicate the message with the aim of understanding. I mean, the essence of all of our practice is, is to, is to dispel the darkness of delusion with the light of wisdom and understanding. So the very deepest sense of what we mean by understanding has nothing to do with views, concepts, rumination, what we think. It's intuitive and immediate. So for example, an insight, a Vipassana insight, does not go through the intellect. It's an immediate attunement to the turbulent system of anicca, change, impermanence, or anatta, the uncontrollability, the selflessness, and the mind not self-referencing experience. We catch that, we attune to that, and we act from that place. The Buddha was with a group of nuns and monks once in a forest, and he reached down and picked up a handful of leaves and said, uh, Bhikkhus, meaning all nuns and monks and lay women, lay men, because what's more, the leaves in my hand are the leaves in the forest. And they answered, oh, venerable sir, the leaves in the forest are far greater than the leaves in your hand. Just so, said the blessed one, all we need to know is like these leaves in my hand. Just a little bit, just the tools for practice. What is mindfulness? What are we mindful of? What is there to be mindful of? Body, feeling, tongue, chitta, consciousness, and mental states and emotions, phenomena, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. That's it. It's so very simple and basic, fundamental, intuitive. And so insight is a sudden intuitive illumination that with these, just this handful of tools, we, we see something to be true, a deep sense of anicca or anatta. After the insight, it may go through the intellect. So, oh, something just happened. And sometimes the yogi doesn't even know. But something shifts, and then maybe in an interview, it comes out that they had this insight. But one doesn't always know that an insight was an insight. But, but I'd say more average is there is that sudden insight illumination where there's no question about the profundity and immediacy of a Nietzsche nature appearing, existing, and vanishing of all phenomena, or anatta nature. It's all beyond anyone's control, the selfless nature of experience. And then a few moments or minutes later, there's a energetic flow of thought formation through our intellect. Oh, something just happened. And then Upandita would say, it's okay to spend a few minutes on wise reflection that something just happened. And, you know, bring it to me tomorrow in the interview. We'll talk about it. Don't dwell on it, because then you'll go off on ruminating, conceptualizing, attached to the experience. Just let it go and reset, reattune to the body and the senses and reapply the sense of seclusion and, and uh, samadhi, collectedness, contentment with things as they are. And the poise 
the, the poise that eventuates in equanimity as a profound and liberating insight. In fact, the highest insight of the insight stages from which then opens the possibility of an irreversible change, shift in consciousness and awakening, touching the Dhamma, the light of the Dhamma. Keeping on the theme of simplicity, I also love the, the, the brief simile the Buddha uses of the elephant's footprint, where he says that just as all the animals on the planet can put their footprint within the footprint of an elephant, so large is our largest land mammal. So too, the Blessed One said, all these teachings, and he, he taught for 45 years. He basically taught the same thing for 45 years, but with eloquent discourse and great intelligence to make things either simple or uh, very refined, very subtle. He said, so too, all the teachings that you hear from me on this 45 year ministry fit into the footprint of the Four Noble Truths. Dukkha, the cause of Dukkha in, in craving and attachment and ignorance. The cessation of that cycle of craving and Dukkha. The cessation where there's a, a gap, a stopping of this round, of this samsara. The epicenter of samsara is right here in our heart. The, the samsara round goes around and around and around because of, of craving and, in, and ignorance. Because of craving and ignorance, we seek for stability. We seek for happiness, often in the wrong place. And that's why there's dukkha, distress, anxiety, suffering. So we see that it ceases. And in that moment, the cessation moment is, is like a temporary Nibbana, Upandita would say. And one can feel just momentarily free of being tethered to these rounds. There's a liberating moment. It's, it's really important to notice when, a, when hindrances or a hindrance falls away. There's a, 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 a non-sensual joy moment or happiness moment there. Like the four kinds of happiness I was talking about, seclusion, concentration, contentment, equanimity. They're not dependent on the environment being a certain way, on things being fixed, on pleasant experience happening. Completely independent of that altogether. So those cessation moments, even if they're brief, See if you can attune to that feeling of relief, which might feel like a kind of gladness or joy, happiness, or appreciation, like mudita, that childlike innocence of unfettered joy. Likewise, I said earlier, To know when we've missed being mindful for a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours, whatever it be, it's very empowering and builds up our confidence, builds up our faith to know that we've not been mindful. So it's not to punish ourselves, it's no, there's no judgment there, it's a wisdom call, it's a wisdom moment to realize, oh, forgetfulness, just forgetfulness. And then just to determine that the next step, the next breath, the next moment, uh, mindfulness attunes and feels from within that experience. 
regarding faith are the Pali term sada, um, meaning confidence, clarity. Upandita once said, all of spiritual practice is the awakening, development, and sustaining of faith from beginning to end. Some degree of confidence is, is necessary the first time we try and practice a moment of mindfulness. First time we try and be aware of the breath, our sensation, our sound, or an emotion. And all along the way, uh, intentionally or as an affect of our practice, this sadha, this, this, uh, this faith and confidence, assuredness, continues to grow and develop. And it carries us through the best and the worst of our experience. We, we have to have a sustaining faith, obviously, when things are really difficult and overwhelming. And we also have to have similar confidence that um, even though we might be experiencing this unbelievable ecstatic bliss, that there's more. To have the confidence and faith that liberation is going beyond all things pleasant or unpleasant going beyond all things. We live in the conditioned world. So this five physical senses and the mind door are conditioned phenomena. They arise, as I was saying earlier, from input and the inner sensitivities. In that contact, there's consciousness. Without the input, without the inner sensitivities, there's no contact, there's no consciousness. That's, that's is, this is the conditioned phenomena. A cessation moment, whether it's the temporary, temporary kind or the more permanent kind, uproots the, the force behind conditionality. We're less conditioned every moment that we just cease these, this epicenter of samsara cease grasping after things or wanting things to be different or being attached to our, our, our views and opinions and rites and rituals and self and so forth. The insights and awakening moments uh, turn a corner where, where faith then is on, on the way to being um, an unbreakable faith. Unbreakable faith, continuous faith. Well, I want to end uh, with a story about my mom. I just spent uh, three months in stay in lockdown, quarantine, everything in, in the, my former family home, uh, now owned by a friend uh, and available uh, when we want to stay there, myself and Michelle, Jesse, Chandra, our daughter. Um, and it's it's the longest I've been there, um, probably in twenty years or more. Um, and so I, I I used a lot of my sun time or exercise time in the garden, working in the same soil my mom ran her fingers through. I got my green thumb from her, and around some of the same trees she had planted uh, and trees that Michelle and I had planted. 
like 40 years ago. It was really gratifying and, and, and nurturing to, to relive that. I, I lived there until I was 11, and then later on in midlife, after Chandra was born. And this is the longest time, probably since Chandra was born, because we were always traveling to retreats. And I practice in the room where I had moved my mom in the last year or so that she was alive when she could no longer stay at, at her house, uh, built a disability room and bathroom. And then t toward the end, um, my mom's doctor, Quinn, told Michelle that she better call me. I, I was on a rural, rural island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and said, I better come, better come back. Uh, it was the height of the season, everything was booked, the boats off the island and the, the cars to the airport and the airplanes to the major cities and then to Honolulu, everything was booked. Um, but I just went anyway and there was just always a place. There was always a cancellation. There was always a room. So I got, I got back, you know, within 20 hours and had uh, 30, 36 hours with my mom and Chandra and Michelle and all my mom's friends were our friends because she outlived all her own. She was 97 uh, and in the last couple hours, and I could see that she was, that it was her time, going to be her time. We just held hands, uh, both of my hands holding both of her hands. Um, sometimes her breathing would, would rise toward hyperventilation. So I'd kind of, I'd meet that and then slow down so that she would slow down, her breath would slow down. And then I could still feel her communicating with me. She wasn't speaking anymore, but through her hand touch, contact and pressure, and the eye contact, steady, unbroken, steady, unbroken, until it was her last breath. And it was just, her death was like Chandra's birth, which I was also there for and part of. And, and the, the room sort of became luminous and light. And if there were tears, there were, there were tears of just a, as much joy as there might have been grief, perhaps more on the joy side. It, that was the feeling in the room. There was just so much love and good feeling and connection and attunement. And it's my wish that however many breaths we have left, that our contact, our touch contact, our eye contact, our breath, be filled with mindfulness and compassion. Thank you. <laughs>